Linux is dead. Long live Linux. Intel and AMD join forces. Tor Springs a leak. And Skype is dead. Proper dead this time. Long live Skype. No, let it die. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> it's still a great day for Linux, everyone. And welcome back to Linux Weekly Daily Wednesday, sitting back, relaxing, taking that midweek break, talking about just some of the things that we personally find fascinating going on, not even trying to pretend we're experts. I'm Ben Stone, joined every week by my inimitable co-host over there in Britannia, one Why, hello. Pedro Mateus. <laughs> Everything went wrong. Yes. Everything went, you just caught all the fires before the <laughs> show, and uh, we still made it because we love you. That's how it works. What's been going on in your life, man? Well, I have been relatively busy, and I uh, I think I'm at the point where, with my project uh, laptop, that I can maybe throw some benchmarks at it and write a little bit of a review. You lot will have to let me know if you're interested in that. Just a uh, random laptop off eBay. Cheap one. <laughs> Pedro started doing some reviews lately, and he, he loves doing them so much, he's buying stuff and piecing it together. It's like a Franken review. Yeah. <laughs> It's custom. It's a custom build. It's like a Honda with a Type R sticker that's not really <laughs> supposed to be there. It's a bit brilliant. Um, got some new toys over here. I did upgrade from uh, 1704 to 1710. Want to let everyone know that went smooth on this box. Why'd you do it, Ben? You don't. I know I'm trying to make the 1804 upgrade as painless as humanly possible because when I get there, we're not going anywhere. Yeah, yeah, 1804 is going to have to last for a long, long while. I'm still on 1604, and kudos to uh, Canonical. Still relatively uh, pain-free, unless you're trying to run Ring. <laughs> yeah, that's something we're going to have to get sorted out in the next few days. It's yeah. uh, not going to be fun. But uh, that's enough talk about Ubuntu. Let's get into a real Linux distribution. Oh! Hey man, the end of I-686 support, it is nigh. Uh, following nine months depreciation mm -hmm. period, uh, the architecture will effectively end. And that day is to date, well, November, whatever day it is, mm -hmm. 8th. It's a thing. Uh, they say. Check it out, though. Uh, there's going to be a community-maintained fork, Arch mm -hmm. Linux 32. Now, we, we've had this conversation Maybe not on this show so much, but definitely on our Saturday show. Mm -hmm. Who still has the 32-bit systems up and running, capable of really doing anything more than being a Chromebook? Okay. <laughs> I still have one up and running, mm -hmm. but that's basically all it does is the Chromebook stuff. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it's. Uh, they also say, because when we first talked about this, and Arch is not the only one that's doing this, Ubuntu is doing this, I think Fedora was contemplating doing this, um, and they say, by the end of November, i686 packages will be removed from our mirrors and later from the package archive. So what are you going to replace Steam with on accounts of that being 32-bit? Because there is no 64-bit version of Steam. Of course there's not a 64 of it, uh, but, I mean, compatibility libs. But that, those are still i686. Ah. <laughs> You're not going to get rid of it completely, man. I mean, that, that's that, that's uh, something that you're going to see in Fedora. It's something you're going to see in the Ubuntu. It's something you're going to see in Hannah Montana. Um, yeah, but uh, Ubuntu said that they would be deprecating the 32-bit ISOs. Yes, totally fair reasonable uh by the packages all the packages really they're not gonna do all the packages <laughs> it's just the way that they phrased it it sounds like it's all the packages well it's a long time coming i mean distributions have switched over to 64 bit and i remember when a lot of distributions were switching over what maybe like three and a half four years ago yeah <laughs> doing this Honestly, if you were running current games at the time, mm -hmm, it mm -hmm. made perfect sense to clutch to the i386 builds for at <laughs> least a year and a half after that because it just saved you so many headaches. Yeah. But in 2017, but nowadays, yeah, I, I, there, there's 
I, I couldn't come up with a reason other than I want to. Or if, you have that really old system that you're if you got the really old system, <laughs> uh, it's cool, man. Each to their own. But you also got to imagine a lot of people running Arch, probably not on i three eighty six. There They're could be. X86, there's always 64. that. Uh, yeah, there's always going to be like that one group of people that are trying to use Arch because it's lightweight and you can get to pick what you want. <laughs> well, you know, there's always going to be that one guy who's going to pull up next to us, you know, peddling his fixie, take a sip of his PBR. And he's <laughs> like, I only run Itanium builds <laughs> and pedal off. <laughs> Yeah, no matter how hard you shot a hipster, he is just not going to care. It's going to be one of those <laughs> things. Uh, something a lot of people cared about last week, my friend, is the Linux desktop. Mm -hmm. Past couple of weeks, uh, it apparently didn't jump. You know, everyone's saying, well, it no. went up to 3%, no. and, you know, lies, damn lies, statistics, and all this. This comes from ZDNet, all this business in our show notes. And you know it's ZDNet because you got to disable auto playing videos that have nothing to do with the story. Good going, guys. Um, <laughs> that is a brilliant thing. So, uh, yeah, 2018, year of the Linux desktop. You heard it here first, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, we were wrong. We, we kind of speculated, Pedro, that it, it could be that it was Chrome OS, a lot of people going yeah. back to school and stuff like that, giving it the bump. Turns out, not necessarily the case. And these numbers were provided by net market share, and the internet lost its fucking mind over mm -hmm. that jump. Well, well, well. Um, at, the, at the end well, of the day, to, to quote this, to quote quote market share, you know, you probably think that net market share, you know, in you know stat counter, they they simply do something wacky and bizarre and crazy and new age, like simply count the numbers. You, you but you would be wrong because they don't. Instead. Uh, each of them use their own mm -hmm. secret formula to come up with the operating system numbers, to which I will retort, mm, because there we go, ladies and gentlemen, these metrics, to me personally, just became about as useful as Steam hardware surveys. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, no, Steam may put uh, the low ball on the Linux count and... Apparently, um, that market share was putting the highball on the Linux market share. Either way, they're both wrong. Uh, they do say uh, that they compare the uh, net market share. They compare their, like, the actual numbers that they get. They compare that to, like, the public CIA numbers that are available to everyone who cares to find them. Um so if, uh, let's say, a certain website, according to net market share statistics, had a million views over the course of a month, but the CIA says that instead it only had like 250,000 views. So they adjust their numbers based on that. And yeah, there that leaves a lot of room for mistake and a lot of room for, oh, Linux is a 5% market share. No, no, it isn't. No. As much as I wanted it to be true... Part of me was also getting a bit scared. It's like, oh, oh, we're actually going mainstream now, huh? Uh, <laughs> it's good to actually have a explanation of this from the people behind it. It's also a bit worrisome to me. Can't, can't we just use numbers? I mean, numbers work. Maths, uh, they tend to tally up to a certain amount at the end of the week. Why do you need a formula to add? <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, there, it can be a bit confusing. And then, you know, we were speculating with the Chromebooks and it could be mm -hmm. IoT devices and like, nope, that's not it. We just messed up. And in that article, kind of turn, had to look at them sideways a little bit. Like, well, we don't really know what happened either. It's, all right. Yeah, you do. <laughs> no, I, you done goof. This uh, is what you did. <laughs> I, 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 when I get to the point to where they, like, we, we, we don't know, we're working to fix it. We don't know what the problem. Koala gif, you know, light, boom, mm -hmm. done, done with that. So, a tool that I will be using later today, and I use mm -hmm. every Sunday, Saturday, Tuesday. We, we do a lot of streams, ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> is Audacity, and they have a new version. 2.2.Not is out. Mm, we, they say big changes, but this um, Ubuntu, so mm -hmm. 
Take that for what you will. Um, <laughs> take a look at it. You can now make Audacity pretty if that is your thing. All the pretty colors for nor, nor new word for new UI themes and also the ability to customize the theme support. This release also makes it possible to import and play MIDI files in mm -hmm. Audacity directly. A lot of people have been waiting for that. I don't. I know what a MIDI is. That's as far as I can go. Plus a hundred. And 98 buck fixes. This is cool. I didn't run out to do it because I don't need the pretty. I, I've always liked Audacity because it's just fuggly. I like me some fuggly because it's functional. <laughs> and it's usually a low resource, Pedro. That... Yeah, it is. Uh, and they also say that uh, the new default recording mode, which they introduced, is when, say, you recorded something on Audacity and then you hit stop. And then you hit record again, and it will start right from the beginning, just on a new channel. Well, that's not like that anymore. It actually starts recording from the end of what you had previously recorded, and goes from there. Could be great for some people, probably going to get on a lot of people's nerves, especially the people who have been using Audacity and expecting that sort of behavior for many, many years. If you weren't already complaining that you didn't like how that worked... You probably will be complaining now. <laughs> but yeah, they also improved the menus. Uh, one thing I wanted to see, uh, which is always kind of made me wonder, is Audacity still likes to use the Ulsa plugin for Pulse Audio. Mm -hmm. And that has its share of issues, namely buffer under and overruns constantly. Uh, so maybe just using Pulse, actual Pulse by default, would be a good idea on accounts of it being the default in distros nowadays? You might think that, but you think I have seething rage against Pulse, towards Pulse? You think I do? <laughs> I got nothing, nothing on the team at Audacity. <laughs> you know, they look at me and they're like, yeah, you're BFFs with Pulse. I'm like, not really, but... Um, that, that'd be interesting. Audacity is an awesome tool. It's relatively easy to learn. You know, it's, it mm -hmm. doesn't do some of the crazier stuff that Audor does, but it also doesn't require you to have Jack installed. <laughs> so, and it doesn't require you to study the manual 48 hours before opening up Ardour to know what anything does. Well, that, that's one of the things I enjoy about Ardour because it tricks you. It makes you think that you know what you're doing. Because it gives you a pretty decent look at the interface, and you're like, woo, immediately over your head. Like, that's why people get paid to do this. But we use Audacity for this show, what little audio processing we actually do. But um, good to see it updated. Uh, looking forward to the next release. So, indeed. So, so, so. Big uh, news of the week. Yeah, the thing we got to talk about uh, the. Uh, the, the bit that's really going to glue this show together. Maybe I'm stretching. A <laughs> I too see far. what you love there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Intel a core processor. It's combining high performance CPU with custom discrete graphics from AMD. Wait, wait, wait. Record scratch. Yep, um, <laughs> you read that right. <laughs> a, a, uh, to enable sleeker, thinner. Yeah, they they've gone and what the actual what. Pedro, th yep. this is... Uh, so, the new 8th gen uh, Intel Core H series will feature an AMD GPU with HBM2 VRAM on the die. Now, that is a very weird looking die. Um, Ben's showing you the video right now, and they show, oh, it's an old style laptop, and you get some gaming, you get some VR experiences, but the performance and the... Um, there it is. That is their uh, rough representation of what it does. HBM memory, a GPU, and the CPU that do very much look like they're glued together. <laughs> and uh, Intel, in that video, they say that it's using some manner of um, high-performance fabric. I'm guessing they don't want to call it Infinity Fabric. Maybe they'll have to give AMD a higher cut of each sale if they do that. But that's probably what it's using. And yep, yeah, there it is. There is the representation of what will be most likely the chip that you will find inside laptops Jeez, going forward. Man, that, that, that 
That is giving me Pentium Pro Flash. It look, kind of looks like a thread. They should make it socket compatible with the. Um... Oh yeah, socket compatible with a thread river. <laughs> But yeah, it is one of the things I really liked about this is because that's one of the things that AMD APUs always fell short on was that they never had dedicated video memory on chip. They mm -hmm. always used a system RAM, which meant that you had to have a lot of system RAM with a high speed to make up for the fact that the GPU had none of its own to access. Now that's not the case. Now there's a dedicated, well, several dedicated HBM modules stacked on top of one another, giving the GPU the memory it so much craves. And it is a Vega chip. It's using the Vega architecture. It remains to be seen just how Intel, you know, dealt with the fact that uh, Vega is a bit of a power hog. A little bit. <laughs> I'm just going to throttle it. And, um, hmm. It, yeah. It's kind of a, you know, I, I'm, I, I'm really guessing that and I think Intel's even said it. We're going to be seeing this business way sooner than later because this is like mm -hmm. definitely one of the worst kept secrets in Silicon Valley. <laughs> Everyone knew it was coming. Right. Everyone's been talking about this. And Intel's like, uh-uh. Uh-huh. <laughs> we're absolutely not doing this. Nope. No, sir. Oh, no. We're absolutely mm. not doing this. Why would they do this? This is a... Let me tell you why they're doing this. It's called 2018 MacBooks. Guarantee on mm -hmm. that. Um... It does look a bit glued together. That's going to come back and haunt you. I forget who it was from Intel when they were quoting um, AMD's Infinity Fabric. Like, oh, it's a glued together solution. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The dream here is to have that wicked ultra thin ultra book that can mm -hmm. kind of pass as a gaming box. You'd be able to get away with it. Yeah. To and the yeah to curb the lead competitor in that particular market. Which is NVIDIA and Optimus. Uh, NVIDIA Optimus. and Optimus. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, the difficulty in this of uh, being Linux, running Linux, the difficulty is going to be the AMD part of that. It's going to be the VIG part of that. And it's going to be interesting. Uh, it's good to see if Intel's like going to make AMD kind of pull a summer because they <laughs> say what you want about Intel. Really good. With their graphics solutions, is mm -hmm. good they are. But far as being open source, yeah, and uh, Intel themselves don't really do a lot of the open source driver development. They just have a ton of money to pay other companies to do it for them. And to be fair, whenever they uh, those other companies hit a bit of a snag developing the drivers, they give them a little push, like here's how you do it. And then they eventually figure it out. That's how we get uh, OpenGL 4.5 on Haswell mm -hmm. GPUs. Yeah, and I say good on you, Intel and AMD. Give NVIDIA a run for their money, kick their throats, and crush their trachea because Optimus, right now, is the single most stale, stagnant, whatever you want to call it, bit of technology that still... It, it is basically ubiquitous if you're trying to buy a gaming laptop. If you've been buying a reason. gaming laptop, absolutely, because NVIDIA's been the power company for a long time. Yeah. Like, you want to play games, you got to go through us. Well, could you change this? Nope. Why? We're the power company. Uh, yeah. Don't have to. <laughs> and my favorite thing throughout all of this has been monitoring our AMD and watching them short circuit. <laughs> they don't know how to react. They don't know because they're like, oh, but Intel's bad, but NVIDIA. It's just like going against NVIDIA, but working with Intel. <laughs> <laughs> it's been glorious. I have enjoyed it. Um, <laughs> Linux Foundation, 25 years of Linux and the GPL, how Android benefits, but uh, really we all benefit from this, Pedro. Oh, yes. Yes, we do. So the Linux Foundation, as they're off to do, they published a little bit of paper uh, on October 25th, if I'm not mistaken, and the fine folks at XDA decided to take a look at that paper. And what they found was 15,600 developers over the years uh, that have contributed to the kernel. Uh, there were uh, uh, 4,300 developers and more than 500 companies that contributed uh, to the kernel since the last report. So that's sizable. That's a very sizable increase. Uh, there were the top 10 organizations that sponsored the kernel development over the past few years, among which were Intel, Red Hat, Lenaro, IBM, Samsung, OpenSUSE, 
or just Seuss, Google, Renesas, Melanox, and AMD. AMD made the top 10. AMD's good. I mean, a lot of those names are the ones that you would definitely expect to be in there. And it's great to see that a lot of kernel development currently right now is being paid by companies. Mm -hmm. We need to get this working. And it's good to be to see that getting done under the GPL because there's a lot of GPL, I mean, especially in the corporate and the business end that Mm -hmm. are naysayers, you know, like BSD license. So, you know. And part of me, part of me, if we're being honest, like, okay, yeah, you're going to spend all this money developing this custom solution and that modifying the code, but I'm supposed to give it away. Yes. If you're doing it with kernel development, you are under the GPL. What's what's, what's, version three, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. uh, I think they had a proposal for version four a while back. I don't know uh, if that ever went anywhere. Honestly, I haven't really kept up. Uh, but yeah, no, version 4.13 of the Linux kernel now has over 60,000 files and over 24 million, almost 25 million lines of code. So that's a bit of a beast right there mm-hmm. that we're running on our boxes without even thinking about it most of the time. So yeah, good good on the Linux Foundation for putting out the paper and shining some light on everyone that's been contributing and actively developing, most of which... Yes, a great deal of them are being paid, but most of which are still um, hobby contributors. They're just doing it on their spare time or because they don't really have anything else better to do because they're unemployed, looking for work. It's also been good there, done that. that it doesn't seem like the brakes have ever been tapped. When I was reading this, I immediately got slammed back to like 1996, 1997. Just kernel revisions every week, stuff like that, just patching, mm-hmm. patching, patching, <laughs> doing this stuff, thinking to myself that um you know it's a breakneck pace it's gonna slow down it's like oh yeah well, by the time we hit 2000 you know maybe we'll get an update <laughs> every six months maybe maybe no no uh-uh. no it, it, it's just still full steam ahead for good for bad i mean sometimes you could say maybe. that because Linux's not so good at backwards compatibility a lot of times Got a lot of tools to help compensate for that. And, you know, we're probably going to have a version of Wine for Linux. Like, when I say that, I'm something like Line. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Because <laughs> we have a bunch of Kaluji solutions, especially for games. You, just games made five well, years ago can be... Point, in, yeah, Lutris. Yeah, not Lutris specifically, but at that point, I'd say that stuff like snaps and flat packs mm-hmm. even app images would be very useful for windows to run those older applications without having to retain that well, snaps compatibility and flat, that, that's all well and good <laughs> and you're like oh i want to download this two 200 meg game how big is it six gigs <laughs> it would never be that ratio mm-hmm. it would be like a five gig game being six gigs because of all the cruft that it needs but yes <laughs> well you just wait until it has to start shipping with an x server <laughs> okay an extra two gigs on top of that <laughs> that will be a thing um raptor bus proof is something we have talked about on this show before oh yes yes it is and, uh, and the fine folks at wired wrote a bit of an article about giving open source projects a life after developers well die and uh this uh came in the news Well, uh, people started thinking about it more and more because of all the news of what happens to people's uh, social media accounts after they die, how that's being handled. And then someone got to thinking, okay, so how about all of those open source projects that are out there that have one, maybe two developers, and if one of them gets hit by a bus and then eaten by raptors, what happens then? Well... I, for one, am old for keeping a project alive after the OG devs uh, handed in the cloak or just up and died. The problem, which isn't really a problem, is when that happens, different groups of people, let's say they had a bit of a team together that was work- that were working on that, they will fork the project and a part of the team will go do that thing they always wanted to do but never managed to push through those people at the top, and the rest of them will try to keep it going or even create their own fork out of that and go a completely different direction. They all get their ducks and they go their own ways. And instead of one, you now have two projects doing very similar things. And then we have people shouting, Fragmentation! But 
we all know better than that, and the article does go into that a little bit. It's uh, it's choice at that point. Do you want that extra feature that one of the teams uh, started working on? Do you want one of the others? If you're caught in the middle, well, you're screwed. Uh, <laughs> but the like the, at the end of the article, one thing they suggest is that um, get more people involved earlier. You don't say. Really? <laughs> That's how you end? It's like, oh, get more people involved. You think that the project wasn't trying to do that all along? Well, I don't know. I mean, one thing they put in here is a dead man switch, and that's something that you want to think about to keep everything up and running. That's what we have here. With our limited funds, there is untouchable amount of cash to ship everything, and I have mm -hmm. a dead man switch, which is just an email, a death note, I like to call it that will cleverly split the resources of Linux Gamecast LLP between Pedro and Jordan to an extent where they will be forced to work together and continue the project. <laughs> Don't worry, we'll bring in Strider to replace you. <laughs> I'm easily replaced, man. Oh, wow, I would love it. See, that would actually make me like want... I've said this before. But I, that, Just have like a near-death experience. <laughs> I would hope for an actual afterlife just so I could watch that nightmare <laughs> unfold. I, I I would give me a big bag of ghost popcorn and I'd be good. I'm just like, he's like, oh, do, do you want to go uh, travel through space? I was like, nope, peace out. I'm good. I got this. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> I got plenty of entertainment right here. But people do that because that, that is a um, very important thing. I mean, even if it's simple, as simple as a, you know, a death note email where you get it, set it on a relay every seven days. If it doesn't hear back to you have, um, the files I was reading through the file the other day, but I was like, this is morbid as hell because I couldn't find a command that I'd written that I needed for a specialized thing we do on the show. And I was like, Oh, I know where it's at. And then I was reading the whole, I was like, Ooh, ooh all right. I wrote that, <laughs> but you know, cause you got to go to GitHub and yo, uh, I, I maintain this now. This other guy, he's, he's no more. He's, he's deceased and all this fun stuff. So yeah, make that easier on people who want your project to live on after you. Yeah. It's always <laughs> a good idea. What do we get up next, man? Up next. Uh, well, you may have heard of this also a big bit of news from the week. Tor sprung a leak. Oh, Namely, nice. uh, if you were trying to access one of the file colon dash dash URLs, when I, honestly, whenever I do that, it's a mistake. But if you did that in Tor uh, on the Mac and Linux versions, well, specific Linux versions, apparently whatever version Tails was running wasn't affected. Uh, but yeah, it's um, there was an issue which leaked your IP address uncompromised through Tor. So basically all that node-based security that you had going on, yeah, no, they could just see exactly where you are. Yeah, it was something that with the um, nice. head over the file. <laughs> you click that, it would just bypass mm -hmm. Tor completely and collect, uh, connect yep. directly to the host. And, uh, you know, kids, it's all fun in games unless, you know, the alphabet agency is running the exit node in the first place. So, yeah, or has control over one. Um... Mm -hmm. Yeah, the operating system. Yeah, that's what it said. The operating system may directly connect to the remote host, bypassing the Tor browser. This has been fixed. This has been patched. You should update if you don't realize that your ISP already has all the information on everything you do anyway. Yeah, just uh, go ahead and try and start a Tor browser in the U.S. See how long it takes for the FBI to come knocking. <laughs> Pedro, if you're not doing anything wrong, you don't have any reason to worry about anything. Yeah, no, yeah. Try and sell that to certain people who get prosecuted on a regular basis on something that most people in the world would just think that it's run of the mill. Yeah. Know, it's like if I send a FOIA request to the FBI and I get back something like shorter than that, I would be disappointed. <laughs> I have no illusions. Someone at the FBI or the NSA is currently watching us right now and going, oh, hey, it's these guys. They know we're watching. Hi, guys. How you doing? <laughs> uh, that's definitely a thing. You found this. Did you find this story? Uh, the yes. Code Vivas. Yes, I did. <laughs> yeah, man. Uh, because I've been keeping up with the Chrome OS announcements. You have had a raging clue for Chromebooks for the past couple of weeks. 
Mm-hmm. Yes, I have. And the fine folks at Crossover, uh, Josh Dubois, namely, uh, spotted a, l- a little announcement on their forum saying that Crossover is now on Chrome OS in beta. Uh, so basically, that's exactly what it is, what it sounds like. It's Crossover, all the uh, proprietary wraparound for Wine is available on the Play Store, and you can install it in your Chromebook if it has Play Store functionality, obviously. Um, (laughs) It is exactly what you'd expect Crossover to be. You can run your uh, Windows applications, be it Office, games, eh, assuming you can find a Chromebook with a high enough horsepower to run those games. Uh, You can do all of that in your Chromebook. And that's, that's actually good. Uh, because, as I said, I've been keeping up with the Chrome OS news because I'm very much looking at a specific Chromebook and I'm totally waiting uh, for Black Friday to see if it drops below 200 pounds. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, this if hmm. it is uh, right now, it's free because it's in beta. Uh, they didn't actually mention like pricing for the Android slash Chrome OS version of Crossover once it's done. Uh, once it's not... Once it's not... Uh, <clears throat> Let's try that sentence again. Once it's not in beta anymore. This must work on um, English, comrade Matthias. <laughs> English very hard. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, it remains to be seen how much it will cost then. But right now it's free. So if you have a Chromebook that supports the Play Store, by all means, go ahead, try it. Try and install Skyrim on it. Let us know how it went. <laughs> the only real concern I have about this is... Uh, a lot of people who buy Chromebooks, they buy Chromebooks, and I'm saying, not you. Your case is different. See, look, we're saving ourselves. Um, I want to tinker with that. <laughs> want to tinker with it, but then again, you're like, man, I need something cheap, and I need something on the go, and I want a Chromebook. Yeah. This thing's 200 wet stinky caches, you know, uh, 199 quid, something like that. Yeah. Uh, th- that's really all that box has enough power to do is run Chrome OS, and so you can go to different web zones. Putting this on top of it, with all those configurations of hardware and stuff like that, uh, now if you have a high-end Chromebook, which they do make, strangely enough. The Pixels, well, yeah. <laughs> and I was reading through the reviews, and people are saying, well, it doesn't do a good job of running Office 2016, which like isn't that online, like Office 3, 365. Uh, Office 365 is online. The 2016 version is supposed to be the one you natively install. Mm-hmm if you want to run it locally. But yeah, it is very much integrated with the whole cloud thing that Microsoft is doing. And yeah, I mean, back in the day, even with those old 32-bit Atom CPUs, most of those netbooks could run Wine to with a good enough speed to run, say, Office 2007, Office 2010. It was doable, and it worked, and a lot of people I remember... uh, Fuduntu at the time, a lot of people who were submitting bug reports about why not working specifically for them because they wanted to run Office uh, 2010 on their 32-bit uh, Atom netbooks. And kudos on Feut, he managed to figure it out and it, it worked. So hey, if Chromebooks can slowly but surely take over the netbook market, thumbs up for me. The declining netbook book, I I guess, to put a bow on this particular story is if running Windows applications under Linux is too easy these days in 2017, too mainstream, you got a new avenue to go explore and keep yourself up later (laughs) playing with that. But cloud services and all that fun stuff kind of segues into Microsoft Mm -hmm. saying 40%, actually, they said only 40, no, it's more than that, uh, of all Mm -hmm. VMs in Azure are now running Linux. A year ago, Microsoft officials said nearly a third of all VMs on Azure were running Linux. Now it's 40%. And this has been a very interesting evolution to watch Azure. You know, it started platform as a service back in 2008. Then around 2012, you know, kind of transitioning into an infrastructure as a service model that also, curiously enough, supported Linux and... It's kind of fun because I personally think the moral of this story is what we've watched is a glacier paced transition of Microsoft Mm -hmm. going the way of IBM is turning into a service 
Scappity. Like, I, I don't think we'll ever see Windows 11. It'll be Windows, you better buy a subscription or you're not getting any updates, Yeah, it's, Brad. they're eventually just going to drop the 10 and it's Windows now. It's an operating system you can put on your PC and you pay X a year and you get some updates. Eventually, it will be free, just like uh, um, Apple did with Mac OS. But it's, uh, that is very much the way that it's going. And we all kind of already knew that that was the way it was going because rumor was it back in the day, long before Windows 10 came out, that Windows 10 was supposedly going to be an entirely cloud-based OS. Of course, that's not the case, but Microsoft is very much still pushing for that. So, and it's hey, also, uh, we should point out that, um, Kali Linux, uh, if you like penetration testing oh yeah, and all that, you can is run that on Azure now. <laughs> now available on Azure. They do have images for that. So you, you can feel like a real lead hack or, um, on your Microsoft, uh, <laughs> as a service model, Azure. Oh, then again, I know some people are stuck running it. So we're, I'm just giving you a hard time because we love you. Um, one last Microsoft story because, uh, if you've tried to log into your Skype and you're in North America yesterday, you noticed it wouldn't log in. Now, your first mm-hmm. thought's been like, hmm, well, Skype's being Skype. Might want to try it tomorrow because Microsoft. <laughs> and this is the old Skype. This is the Skype, uh, the client that was developed by the original owners before Microsoft walked in and just, uh, yeah, did things to it that we can't say. Yeah. It'll just automatically sign you out now. I noticed this yesterday. Uh, Pedro, you said in uh, Europea not having that yeah, issue Yeah, it in still Britannia, works. Right? I can still log in, but when I look at my contact list, only the people in Europe, like people here in the UK, in Portugal, and a few others dotted around Europe that I have on my contact list. Wow, those look, still somebody, appear somebody's as right online. Uh, <laughs> somebody's still comp- because the new Skype 64 bit only, which is Electron. Uh, ah, yes. <laughs> running 17.3. <laughs> Someone genuinely still running a 32 bit only system. And yeah, the the new version of Skype, it's Electron based and it's using uh, the Chrome, Chromium embedded framework, Mm -hmm. 64 bit. Uh, So yeah, it's running the 64 bit version of Blink, which is the engine that runs Chrome and Chromium, what have you. So yeah, you will need, in order to install that particular one, you will need to have a 64-bit system, or install Chromium on your 32-bit OS and just run Skype for web. Skype for web. Uh, wouldn't be a problem if the updated version of Skype, which we tried at the beginning of the show last week, and it just mm-hmm, mm-hmm. slowly, but very slowly, um, very quickly died a horrible death halfway through the show. Yeah. Yeah. It's a very busted piece of kit. There's no way around it. We were talking before we went live. It's like, you know, wouldn't even be an issue at all if you would give me something functional. I Because I, mm-hmm. I, I wouldn't even use the word working. <laughs> give me something functional like that I can work with, work around, kind of make work Microsoft. Mm-hmm. Th- they're not having any of that. They're just like, no, use this completely busted piece of nope. Th- this thing that we're, we, you need to use it. And it's like, but it sounds worse. It's buggy as hell. Um, doesn't have full functionality with anything. Uh, likes and to uses crash. about five times more RAM. Oh, uh, <laughs> absolutely. I mean, it's just a busted piece of nope. Uh, had a good run with old Skype. It's, uh, we're currently using Discord right now for audio. Let, yep. us, l- let us know. So Send you us will feedback. have to let us know. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> if you could, which really kind of bums me because I was going to make a video. I was going to get a couple of people on and we were going to jump from old Skype to new because I just to see how massively worse their WebRTC mm-hmm. implementation of Skype yeah. is at all I can say on Linux. I don't have a Windows box or anything else to test it on versus the old Skype that we had previously been used. It is jarring. And I'm not an audiophile, but oof, it was bad. You're a much bigger audiophile than either me or Jordan. That's, that's for because sure. I got to listen to you <laughs> yahoos for hours upon hours upon <laughs> hours. At least I can do is try to make it sound good to keep myself occupied while editing. That's also Fair enough. All right. Um, Pedro, let, let's read an ad uh, about a mattress uh, made of jello. That, <laughs> that, that It's what, really good for you. No, no, it isn't. It Don't also sleep flies. On it also flies. <laughs> 
<laughs> okay, if it flies, I would actually be tempted to read an ad for no, that. No, what we are yeah. going to do is thank the 100 <laughs> lovely, beautiful party patrons supporting Woo-hoo. this show, keeping us ad-free, even though we might want that flying, flaming um, mattress uh, that would also make a Jello band name. flaming mattress, yes. Currently doing $195 <laughs> A week. That's brilliant. That's for this oh, show that's right. and Saturday show. It is. There was real. a bit of a month transition here, so if you don't want to resubscribe to us, that's up to you. We appreciate it anyway. Thank you for uh, all the wet, stinky caches that you provided us with. They will be put to good use. But do check your credit card because the month just went out, so your credit card probably expired. Credit card maintenance. It's not for us. Listen, You're probably listen, going to need it some for people, something else. Some people pay in doubloons. <laughs> that is true. Yes. <laughs> no. If you're a bit on the fence, man, think about it. Uh, Want to support us? That'd be awesome. Uh, get some cool stuff. Become a patron. We love them. And speaking of patrons, because we get to say, "Oh my God, we get to cam girl a little bit, Pedro." <laughs> a little like, bit. Oh, we love you. We love you. You're so special because you are. You are really, truly special. Starting with long time. Long time listener of the show. One Mr. Alert mm-hmm. became a patron last week. Kind of shocked. I was like, Yay! what? <laughs> yeah, I saw him because you, you can now have access to our Discord where we like to hang out the other mm-hmm. six days a week, get access to the audio only version of this live stream. That's definitely going to be a thing. A- and your name in the credits. And also, Phil, Mr. Phil. No, 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 not the guy who was the voice of Shredder. This is a completely <laughs> different Phil. He's even cooler. Um, he has yeah. increased his pledge. And finally, we got a little bit of an Amazon wish list, Pedro. Oh, yes. <laughs> that, that, is, that is where we put stuff that we absolutely do not need and will never use. All we do is we take that stuff and we put it in the back of our gold-plated Lamborghinis. <laughs> Admittedly, there were a couple of things that weren't really necessary really? in that list. But a couple of people uh, looked at it and said, you know what? I think Vendel is going to enjoy this. But that was last week with Strider uh, getting you the Steam Controller. <laughs> As I said, Strider, sweetheart, girlfriend, I'm forcing myself to enjoy it despite you. No, but... Um, but yeah, this week we have uh, something which may or may not power oh, check it out. sexy toys. <laughs> wait, 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 we can't talk. If you want to go see, the, if you want to go see that, uh, go, 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 go watch uh, Saturday's episode. No, man, USB Type-C... Uh, Aluminium hub from Steve-O. You know him. You love him. He's actually powering the box right now. He also picked us up an NVMe drive a while back. Mm-hmm. And um, again, Frank is at choir practice, but he will um, definitely be thanked on Frank's fine upstanding cannibal wool. That yes. is brilliant. Yes. Thank you, everybody who heads over and also shops through our affiliate links. That is like oh, the yeah. most frictionless <laughs> way in the world. I do that for other shows because we're not supposed to do it with our own show. And I can go over to their web zone, hit their support thing, whatever. Click on the Amazon. I did that, Pedro. Actually, I remembered to do that. For one of my buddies <laughs> because, you know, we picked up something this week with the help of our patrons. Ooh. You, you ooh was up? it a teeny tiny thing or a big, ooh, really big thing? R- really? <laughs> it's really big. What we're looking at for the audio listeners is a uh, 22 channel four two by two bus uh, mixer of nightmare fuel. Uh, who was it that said it? I think it was our Theron in Discord that said, that's a lot of knobs. <laughs> It's a lot of knobs. Um, <laughs> fortunately, my background from playing in bands and being the audio engineer, I, I kind of know what I'm doing, but it's a di- also a digital mixer. Not 100% what we were going for, but we kind of dodged a bullet with the XR12 because it turned out that it didn't have a USB out on it. That's bad. <laughs> well, we our budget, you know, we genuinely pinch the pennies, man. And we mm-hmm. don't have a lot of money coming in at the end of the month when our bills are paid. We're like, Ugh. so it kind of took us a year to get $250 set back. <laughs> and this money just goes back into the show. It's again, uh, yeah. it's kind of, it's kind of making up the gold plated Lamborghinis. Um, <laughs> so this one I was braining on. I was like, okay, let's get it at the end of November. It does 95% of the stuff. Same price. We didn't really save any money. It was 250 bucks. Mm -hmm. But I got an open box version because Pedro, I think, can attest. I'm very cheap with our money. Penny pincher. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I'm really good. If you want somebody to be in charge of finances, I'm probably the guy because I don't like spending money. And I I found an open box. It's $195. We got the other noodles. But this is going to let us have up to six... 
you know, realistically, we can have seven people on a show. I'll be able to do some stuff with the mix minus and uh, also a call in. So, mm -hmm. and a dedicated live stream for audio for discord and a dedicated stream just for discord. So we'll never have any of the echo things. So thanks again, everyone. Uh, for, you're going to need some noodles. <laughs> I've got some noodles coming Thursday, hopefully. Uh, <laughs> you guys made that possible. And it, oof, as long as I don't end up throwing it out a window <laughs> or through a wall, we'll start having some fun in the upcoming weeks. Thanks again. For it that. will be embedded in the wall. <laughs> yeah, it'll be an embedded mixer. It's a <laughs> good thing. All right. Uh, all, all that shilling and thanking everyone has made me a little hungry. Yes, I check that out. Is it, that, that, that's definitely actual pie. raspberry pie. Neat raspberry <laughs> pie, man. That uh, I don't like sweets, but that look. I like raspberries. Mm -hmm. yeah, I might raspberries. Try. They have that bit of it of a twang to them. The twang, <laughs> as he says. Um, <laughs> all right, Baristabot, fully autonomous corporation. This is where we like to talk about smaller embedded thingies that I. Uh, well, they are, are kind of redundant. They have that neat factor, but who would actually use that? And here we have it, a Bitcoin-operated coffee maker. I'm not kidding. That's exactly what it is. <laughs> a coffee machine connected to the internet and server and server's coffee. My bad. Um, okay, this, this would be more... Okay, well, look, listen, we can adapt this for our audience. This could be adapted to serve shots. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, it could. And the bitcoins that you uh, paid for each drink would go back to fund, you know, refills. Okay, all getting right. more drinks. Well, well, mm, 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 mm. <laughs> Time out right here. here. Here's the problem with bitcoins. Um, also, send us all your bitcoins. Uh, Worthless. They, they're going to go out of business tomorrow. Then um... <laughs> <laughs> here's the thing. Man. Here's the thing. If I uh, spend. Well, what's in uh, one MBTC at right now? Like four, five, six, seven dollars. Uh, I think it was seven last time I checked. Something like that. <laughs> and uh, let's see, you got like two coffees. Okay, you got two coffees. You know, fancy coffees, coffees that you and I would probably never buy. All right. Yeah. No. <laughs> right. But let, uh, let's say yeah, I, I've given somebody a copper, and mm -hmm. um, they they just came back with their coffee. It was like what. <laughs> I didn't know they made it like that. But uh, let's say we got fancy. We're out treating ourselves. Mm -hmm. 20 years from now, one MBTC is worth $10,000. Wouldn't that keep you up at night? <laughs> what, just a little bit? Like, Imagine imagine that guy that paid 20,000 bitcoins for a pizza. Actual bitcoins, not MBTCs. Actual bitcoins, mm -hmm. yeah. I bet he's lost some uh, good few nights of sleep. <laughs> And no, I don't drink fancy coffee, Steve-O. Uh, I actually just go for the cheap stuff. But yeah, no, it's it, it's a Bitcoin-operated coffee maker. Well, that's cool. I mean, they, they, okay. <laughs> you got your raspberry in there, you can stick it together. And um, I don't know, do you, do you honestly think, do you see, like kind of as an aside, I've never seen a place IRL that that makes you sound like such an old person irl hashtag irl um i'm trying to be hip ben um steve Bush. Uh, <laughs> hello fellow kids, hello, fellow kids. <laughs> um i haven't seen any place taken bitcoin but even there in, are a couple of places specific places i can't remember their names but there remember, are a few but that i'm saying like it. in the real world now any type of bitcoin donation we get we go through purse io which has been around forever. Mm -hmm. They operate as an Amazon exchange, and it's not like Frank Shady, mm -hmm. you know, Amazon. Bitcoin they're, they're, exchange. Right, they're yeah. a legitimate <laughs> company that where we could exchange Bitcoins for equipment. And um, yeah. But no, I've never seen a place like physical like here in Athens or in downtown Atlanta where I work. I think there's one place uh, here in Cambridge that uh, has it, because I remember seeing it in the news while I was going to work. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it'll take, uh, apparently it's NFC. So if you have your purse set up on your phone, it'll just, whoop. <laughs> so one, one, one thing I love about my Nexus 10 is it's got NFC and I get Google wallet. So I like sticking it on the card reader. <laughs> just like, oh, sir, <laughs> sir, just give it a minute. Just get, there it goes. Give it a bit. 
<laughs> it's kind of brilliant. Um, pew, 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 and tanks and pie. Play laser tag with oh, the raspberry yeah, pie. Oh, this. And Arduino. This I like. Yep. So if you have a couple of raspberry pies and Arduinos lying about, and you'd like to make some actual toys, a little bit of a Christmas project for uh, the children or whomever other geeks you happen to have uh, in your place, stop kidnapping people, uh... <laughs> You can actually put together a couple of laser tag tanks. Uh, they, uh, the, the ones you see there were actually handmade. Uh, they 3D printed some of the stuff, including the wheels. Uh, the panels are made out of wood and they painted them to look, uh, the part. And, well, they're tanks that fire a pew 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 at one another and they will play some sound effects when they're hit to basically and you can if you have the programming jobs for it you can keep a score tracker so it is very much i like toys like genuine toys rc toys have always been a particular favorite of mine so this is very neat this this i like <laughs> yeah, i could definitely get behind something like this but i mean i, I like throwing this type of stuff in just because of the kid factor um mm-hmm there's nothing better to get kids interested in showing them scaled down versions of uh, machines designed for mass <laughs> murder. It's really wholesome. Nihilism. It's great, kids. You should try it. <laughs> I, that's a joke. I mean, they're, they're tanks, man. Kids play with tanks. Or, they're teeny tiny, uh, in this case, wooden tanks that yeah. go pew, 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 quite literally. And... I don't know. Maybe BattleBots will still be a thing when they grow up and they'll make the next Blendo or something like that. It'll be yeah. pretty cool. <laughs> so that's going to do it for the show, Pedro. It's been real. It's been fun. Tell the people how they can get in contact with us. And I think uh, we do have uh, one message. Uh, yeah. One significant message. And if you'd like to be like Adam, who sent us some uh, feedback, you can go to LinuxGameCast.com. You hit the contact button. You fill out the form. Make sure to pick LWDW from the little drop down thing. That's it. If you'd like to leave some other bit of hate mail, uh, relationship advice, questions, what have yous, make sure to pick the appropriate category for that. But this... This comes from Adam, and he's talking about the GPD Win 2. Uh, I've been watching all these different attempts at making uh, gaming handheld PCs, but I'm still waiting for one I like. I remember watching the development of the Pandora. That's the name of the one we can remember. The Open Pandora. Unfortunately, that ended up being underwhelming for how expensive it was, and it was very expensive. The Smack Z look promising <laughs> i'll be very surprised if it lives up to the expectation it won't or if it comes out at all which it won't uh i'd kill for a good gaming pc handheld i wouldn't even need to i wouldn't even need it to play higher end games it'd be fine with it just playing 2d indie games uh my priv with a bluetooth gamepad does scratch that itch a bit but there are very few good traditional games that end up on android anymore I'm with you on that one. And he mostly just has Shovel Knight, the Shantae series, and those kinds of games on there, and of course, Retro Arch. Uh, while he doesn't like the layout of the GPD Win 2, nor the first one, I guess I can sort of see that. Maybe uh, he's thinking he should give it a shot when it comes out. Maybe it'll surprise him. Show less. Oh, I guess that came from YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure that whatever dumbass copied and pasted that in um, just, just missed it. He should be fired. It's like, show less. Get rid of that what? joke. <laughs> um, yeah, with the Steam Boy, the Smash Z, or whatever they're going to call it in 2018 and still not make it. Um, nope. Just just give up on that. And listen, we, we don't say things to, I don't well, some people do believe that on our gaming show Linux Gamecast that you check out on Saturdays we don't hate on things to like get a clue a raging clue about we're like oh we're just like hating on things when, when we see BS our BS detectors mm -hmm. go off and that Steam Boy smashes that and all set it off like crazy and way oh, yeah. back when mm -hmm. we're like this this is not going to be a product that is not a real prototype don't 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 three <laughs> and a half some years and later and for those right <laughs> 
Yeah, and for those actual products that we have uh, looked at, not physically, but we've had a look at the articles and everything else, and we criticize those, chances are, if we are criticizing them, if we are taking the time to address that product and making a critique, whether you agree with it or not, chances are it's because there's something we would like to see improve. In the case of the Open Pandora, we were very much with Adam here, that was way too expensive for what was a glorified Android tablet with a Well, there's nothing wrong with the Pandora. They're made in such an incredibly small <laughs> batch. I mean, it is... You do, uh, they're just making... Yeah, you're basically p paying the iron price for it. <laughs> you know, you... Like hand... <laughs> artisanal, man. Single source. Free range. Um, that's what you're yeah, paying for. Yeah, but it... It was still way too expensive. Oh, it was. It, was. it absolutely euros. was. But if you wanted one, it was also an actual thing that you could actually get. Yes. And it did what it said on the tin. If you could let go of the money. I I, I can hate on it only in the aspect of, like, I'm not spending that much money for a, yeah, a something. way too looks, expensive. Looks like a diseased Game Boy. Um, <laughs> nothing against the project. I think the project's great. And I'm very impressed that they managed to produce what they did with what and they had. And now the had. Pyra. Uh, now, Atomic, <laughs> with a GPD, he was very in somewhat impressed with it. Yeah, because the GPD also had the factor that, okay, it wasn't an i7, it was a Y7. Uh, it's like the Atom version of that, but it is very much a full-on PC with a touchscreen with everything that you would expect an x86 tablet to do, which came with Linux preloaded. Uh Admittedly, it didn't run very well. There were a few issues. Uh, fortunately, there's a sizable enough community around it now that they've managed to work out most of the issues mm -hmm. uh, with the Ubuntu version of the GPD Pocket. So, yeah. <laughs> That's pretty cool, man. Um, yeah, with the mobile aspect, um, mobile gaming has never appealed to me. The handhelds, mm -hmm. uh, the original Game Boy original the brick i the had that <laughs> and didn't even ask for it it just showed up when my mom was like, here thing it's like oh all right <laughs> I, I i chewed up through a lot of double a's playing the mario game like the original mario world or whatever it would when if you beat it the first time like oh, the characters turned into bees i'm not making this mm -hmm. up <laughs> Spent a lot of time on that in some Mega Man game, but that was it. That was my mobile gaming. Outside of that, I'm done. I'm never, like, if I'm out and I'm mobile and I'm in my motoring vehicle, I got to have both hands to drive. <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> there's that. I've never tried. Listen, I got, I, I got more tablets in Deep Space Nine. Never really thought about yeah, gaming on them. Yeah. And the PSP, I had a PSP. Well, like, you own a gaming ones. tablet. You own one that was marketed. It came with a gaming controller, the NVIDIA Shield. Yes. <laughs> the Shield tablet, which came with the Shield controller, mm -hmm. the other Shield. <laughs> and it is for gaming. If you're looking for a reasonably priced Android tablet with the intent of playing Android games, by all means, get the Shield or the Shield tablet K1. Um, because they are still, they still have like the best price performance ratio that you can get right now. Even after all this time, what are these people doing? <laughs> but yeah, I had the PSP back in the day and that, uh, after I, uh, did the jailbreak on it, uh, loaded up some custom firmware because Sony decided to play loose with their end user license agreement. And I said, no. I don't agree with it. <laughs> and if you can have an um, emulator or something like that. Yeah. Each is your own. That's really cool. Uh, thank you for the feedback. Again, if you'd like to scream at us, just LinuxGameCast.com. Hit the contact button. YouTube video, you can leave a comment, but uh, I'm saying don't have 100% that, that is A, going to be seen. No one's going to promise that because we don't always get them all the time. And... Um, mm -hmm will make it to the show it's the easiest way to at least make sure we yeah. read it contact form use it contact <laughs> that's what it's there for we don't keep track of your email address and if you're going to make up an email address at least make up one that will resolve so it doesn't get instantly something that into. ends in at gmail.com yeah basically <laughs> do that 
<laughs> okay. That was another great day for Lennox. And it's time to cue the credits. Ooh, hey. credits. Yeah, this is where all y'all lovely people, if you decide to support the show, to keep us, keep it on, so to speak, you end up right here with the executive producers or with the producers. You all get a say. If we're doing something you don't mm-hmm. like, by all means, let Thanks us know. If you'd like us to do something else, 16 by all means, quarters, let us know. 16 quarters a month. If everyone chipped yep. into that, not only will we be back up to serious swaying levels. Mm-hmm. I mm-hmm. know you're thinking, listen, you got to think the same way I think. It's like, man, I ain't got a ton of money, but I can at least kick a buck to a show the people I like. There's some shows I'm like, yeah, I watch it, I don't like it. We feel you on that, mm-hmm. man. 